Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of What's Happening. I'm here with my co-host, George Bins, and today we're going to be continuing our series of climate change or global warming shows that we've had with Frank Bellini and Kevin O'Reilly. Both have been alone in their presentations presenting their side of the issue in the past. Today, we have both on to discuss the climate change global warming debate. And after listening to this and the next show, because it's going to be too long for one show, you can decide where you stand. Uh, both sides will be professionally brought forth to you and Hopefully, uh, you'll understand the sides, make your own decision, and in, enjoy the show. George, would you like to introduce our guest, please? Well, the two guests we have tonight, as uh, Elliot has mentioned, have been on the uh, show before as uh, individual participants. And in favor of or advocating some doing something about global warming, uh, we have Kevin O'Reilly, a retired teacher from Danvers, I believe, and a longtime activist in the climate business. And from the position of a geologist, environmental scientist, we have uh, Frank Bellini, who's been in the business for quite some time from uh, a professional point of view. So Elliot, time for the first question. Okay, gentlemen, we'll start this with, with um, Kevin. Kevin, you go first, and then Frank will answer. Uh, is there global warming or climate change, and is it natural, or is it man-made, or is it both? Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me on. Frank, good to see you. Um, I, I do want to correct uh, George. Um, I was a history teacher in Hamilton Wenham and I live in Beverly. Um, I am a climate activist and I've written, my area of expertise is in critical thinking. I've written 29 books on critical thinking and decision-making. Um, and uh, when we discuss this, uh, I, I want to uh, people to think about um, how do you decide these things? As an ordinary citizen, how do you decide? And I'm going to argue here, and have I shared my screen? Can you see, see the screen there? Yep. Okay. Um, that, that we use critical thinking, not, not our own biases, but we look at the evidence and we really evaluate the evidence. So th these are the three things that I'm going to uh, focus on. Uh, how strong is the evidence? And we're going to look at, at some of uh, Frank's graphs. Uh, how reliable are the sources? And we're going to look at some of Frank's sources and how strong is the cause and effect? So those are the three things that um, I'm, I'm going to focus on. I'm asking people to keep an open mind and evaluate based on the evidence. On some of the screens, there's going to be a box up in the top left, and that's going to say which of those three skills uh, I'm, I'm talking about. For example, how strong is the evidence? So please keep that in mind. Um, I think that critical thinking empowers ordinary citizens like me uh, in order to make decisions uh, on our own. So uh, it, it's an important thing. Uh, and when we look at Frank's graphs, we're going to see that there's some problems with them. And uh, we'll go into detail about that. So if we move on to uh, what I think about global warming, this is one of Frank's graphs that he presented before. And it made me think about, um, he's, he's arguing in this graph that the temperature is going up and down constantly. And, and that's, that's a, you know, so what's new kind of, kind of view of that. And uh, it got me thinking about um, global warming. The causes here are, uh, many of them are natural. Uh, and, and we're not arguing that there aren't natural causes. So anything you say about, well, there's natural causes, I'm going to say, yeah, I agree. Uh, you'll see that greenhouse gases is the second one there, and it's also down below. And that's because we think that humans are now contributing a lot more greenhouse gases. And that's a big factor in our climate these days. So keep that in mind. And so when you think about it, uh, about 
global warming and these causes have been around, it made me think of diabetes. Diabetes also has several causes like genetics, exercise, and genetics isn't even in our control. I mean, you can't control genetics at this point. Uh, if you had a cousin who had diabetes and then ate cake all the time, you'd say, well, you know, maybe you shouldn't do that. And if your cousin said, well, you know, uh, it's not the cake eating. There are natural other causes for my diabetes. And besides, my blood sugar has gone up and down a lot before I was eating cake. So the cake here is the uh, greenhouse gases and the natural causes of uh, blood sugar here is like the natural causes. So to say, well, we've had this in the past, doesn't really do it. Uh, and I do want to say for full disclosure, um, if you said to them, you know, stop eating that cake, I assume everybody would do that. Uh, I do not get any funding from the cake industry. Okay, the leading scientists say that there is global warming. You can see it. These, uh, I did these in my other talks. These are the leading scientists in the world and in the country who say it's a result of human activity and it's very serious. Um, this graph shows it going up. It's pretty obvious it's going up. And you can see that 2016 there is the highest uh, temperature. And 2020 is just as hot. It's going up. And it's going up because partly, mainly because people are doing that. So if we go back to Frank's graph, uh, he says the temperature is going up and down a lot. And he also, so the question is, well, um, is CO2 related to that? And Frank had said in his talk, I can't see it right now, uh, if you overlay a CO2 graph, you'll see they're roughly correlated. Well, I decided to do that. And it turns out that's an understatement. They are completely correlated. Uh, so if you see here, the red is the temperature and the blue is CO2. Uh, there, when one goes up, the other one goes up. Now in Frank's talk, he said, so should I stop right here in the middle? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Frank to uh, bring in his points of view. Okay. That, so I'll stop sharing, Frank, so you can... Um, okay, thank you. Uh, I, give me a second here. Uh, let's see, if I hit escape and then stop share. Okay, I'm getting better at this. And there we are. All right, thank you. All right, very nice. That's a nice background, Kevin. Interesting. Uh, my decision analysis background is mostly with Kepna Trago, uh, if you know who those guys are. Good stuff. They use it on nuclear submarines. So uh, it stood me in good stead for a long time. I, uh, I was 45 years a geologist and environmental scientist in the nuclear power industry. So that's where my background and interest comes in science. Uh, I've gotten interested in this uh, climate science business, however, because we're about to bet trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars on one side of the issue. And uh, I do not believe that that is the correct side of the issue. Uh, reason and science, and particularly the scientific method, has been abandoned uh, in the search for uh, proof that CO2 is the climate knob, control knob for the planet. And I'm going to show you what is one of the climate control knobs for the planet in a minute but uh, it will not be carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is present in the atmosphere at a concentration of 0.04%, a minuscule amount of trace gas. And I would not even accept the hypothesis, let alone the theory that CO2 is the control knob for the planet. In addition, I'm gonna show you what, uh, how to calculate and correlate with real temperatures for a number of different space bodies in our solar system, uh, temperatures uh, where they should be, where they are, and uh, make you a believer, I hope, uh, in using science uh, rather than chocolate cake uh, to explain this. A lot of forces have aligned here to claim that uh, there is a settled 
science here, and those are their words, not mine. Uh, I call it an unproven hypothesis of catastrophic man-made global warming slash climate change induced by atmospheric CO2. Uh, it's a flagrantly absurd idea in my mind. And uh, when you get into the science of it, uh, without the bias that comes from funding uh, from a few very rich individuals and a few very rich organizations and governments, uh, you'll begin to understand what it's all about. It's not that easy to find the information on the Internet because the Internet is flooded uh, with information from the other side. But I'll, I will give you websites and show you where to look. So let me try and screen share here. In the early 1900s, there was a scientist, an astronomer, by the name of Milankovitch. And he observed, I'll get you here in a minute. He observed some oddities with respect to the orbit of the Earth around the sun, the tilt of the Earth's axis, which of course we all know gives us our seasons, and a wobble in the Earth's axis, just like when you spin a top sometimes, uh, you get a little wobble uh, in, the, um, in the spin. And each of these represents a factor in... We got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, Milankovic, a Serbian astrophysicist back in the early 1900s, defined what's called Milankovic cycles. You can see here that the Earth does not always have, first of all, it never has a round orbit around the sun. It always has an elliptical orbit around the sun. Sometimes it's more compact. At other times, like now, it's more stretched out. And this is an example of the orbit that we're currently in, the stretched out one. Uh, what happens in the stretched out orbit is that in wintertime, and here we are in wintertime with the North Pole tilted away from the sun, uh, we get a relatively uh, short, brief, uh, mild winter and a long, hot summer. When it reverses the other way or when the orbit shortens up, that can change dramatically. Now, what happens is that the maximum effect occurs for Milankovitch cycles at the 65 degree latitude level, which is right here around the Arctic Circle. We're not seeing that. Right? Oh, you're not seeing that? No. We're we're seeing seeing that. So this is the extended elliptical orbit. This is the compact elliptical orbit. Uh, this is the precession or the wobble. Uh, this is the tilt that we know gives us the seasons. All these three factors operate on different time scales and they affect in particular the 65 degree latitude on Earth, which is right here at the Arctic Circle. Uh, I'll skip over some of this stuff. If you want a good discussion of this, you go to the University, Indiana University website, and uh, they will inform you on it. Um, key points that they talk about is that ice ages are not due to total, total solar energy reaching the Earth. Uh, that cooler weather at the equator does not cause an ice age. Of course, if it's warm all year round at the equator and you get a little bit of cooling, it's not going to affect things very much. But if you get a lot of cooling at 65 degrees latitude, and you can get an awful lot of cooling as much as uh, 50 degrees Fahrenheit difference uh, as a result of Milankovitch cycles, you can start to accumulate snow, which will compress into ice, uh, which then leads to a glaciation. And the um, graph that Kevin showed um, in uh, a little bit blurry there. I'll have a better one for you later, I hope. Uh, the graph that Kevin showed has a periodicity that relates to a combination of these precession, um, obliquity, and eccentricity uh, oddities of the Earth's orbit. And that's why you get glaciations and warming periods and glaciations and warming periods over and over over the last million years for major cycles uh, it, more recently 
and uh, almost a dozen uh, major and minor cycles uh, over many years, uh, many th- hundreds of thousands of years. Okay, Frank, I got to stop you there and let I'm good. Uh, Kevin go. Frank, can you stop sharing, please? Yes. Gee, I just got that right. Do I have to? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so back to what I was saying. Um, I wonder if I can uh, move that thing. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so I was saying about the uh, people. So I had been talking about uh, carbon dioxide and temperature. And Frank was arguing that the temperature is what controls the carbon dioxide. Temperature causes carbon dioxide increases. That's and, correct. Uh, no, that's incorrect. Because if you look at this circle, um, one thing I learned in history is causes come before effects. And the uh, carbon dioxide is going up before the uh, temperature. It's actually both. And that's what's really frightening about this. Just remember, viewers, that Frank agreed that the temperature is correlated with CO2. And in the past 50 years, uh, it's clearly due to man. Clearly, the carbon dioxide is... I I have to disagree with you completely there. So please don't put words in my mouth. You can speak for your own opinion. Frank, I did not say anything while you were talking. Um, Okay, Frank had said... Uh, in in his talk, um, when temperature goes up, CO2 effervesces out of the ocean, kind of like when you open a can of Coke. And that's what's frightening about it, because one reinforces the other. And so what could happen is as the CO2 in the atmosphere goes up, the ocean at some point might start belching more CO2, which would increase the temperature. What's frightening about that is it's one's reinforcing the other. It may get out of control. The other thing is when there was rapid greenhouse gas uh, gas increases, there were extinctions of creatures, mass extinctions. So we're playing with fire here. Uh, And we know, we already know that um, through experiments that greenhouse gases uh, absorb heat radiation. And we've known that for 160 years. Um, We have, increased CO2 dramatically in the last uh, just century. And that's like somebody eating cake all the time that has diabetes. It's not going to be good for us. Now, you had mentioned the point about uh, natural causes, and I wanted to go back to your graph. So again, if we just look at this uh, one part, because that's the part where humans are on earth. If we take that graph and stretch it out, the ups and downs don't look so up and down. And if we take just 20,000 years instead of, uh, you know, 800,000 years, now the graph doesn't look like it's going up much at all. So let's take a look at the time period where humans are on earth. Uh, So the the, the last 10,000 years, it's gone up by one degree Celsius one degree up and down. It's a little more than that, but about one degree. And within there, there's ice ages. So playing with one degree Celsius is serious. Not in the last 8,000 years. Absolutely not. The last ice age ended 12,000 years ago. That's when the ice began. Little ice age, little ice age. Little ice age. Okay, Mm -hmm. stop interrupting, please. Okay, so if, if the people in the audience take a look at this graph, where do you think the, the line, this is temperature now, where do you think the line is going to go? And you guessed it. It's going almost straight up in temperature. In just 100 years, we've gone up a degree, whereas in the last 8,000, it's varied only by about a degree. And it could go up another two to three degrees in the next uh, 80 years. And these are by leading scientists. Uh, If we do just the last 2000 years, again, now the line is flattening out. And by now you've probably got an idea that the line goes almost straight up. So this is something a little different than what's in the past. Uh, I don't know, how how am I doing on time, Elliot? 
You got about 20 seconds. Okay. Anyway, the point is these graphs actually prove that what we're doing is a massive, massive chemistry experiment with the, uh, with the earth, the earth's atmosphere. And that's kind of frightening. Okay, we got through, through the first question. Now the second question, let's try and do it in three minutes instead of the, the five because we're running out of time. Although actually I'm sure that we can do a little uh, cutting of the, the dead time to, to make it, but let's try and be a little bit quicker. Uh, the question is, is the sea level rising and why? I think, I think and this is for Frank. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the simple answer to that is yes. And it has been rising for a very long time uh, relative to man's time on Earth. Uh, during the height of the last glaciation, about 12,000 years ago, uh, sea level was 400 feet lower than it is today. So that being the case, um, the glaciers started to melt and all of the water that was tied up in that continental ice cover uh, went back into the oceans. It continues to rise today. And I think because of warming and expansion of the water itself, rather than any addition from the polar ice caps. Uh, if you would take a look let me try and do this a little bit better here this time. Zoom meeting, share screen. Let's go back here and take a look at a, a clearer version of this. Um, and let me ask you, where, just as an aside here, where, where do you think the next leg of this graph will go? My bet is it's going down here, not up here. All right. Now, Kevin would probably argue because of CO2 it's going to go up higher. I, I don't think so. Uh, CO2 as a gas, uh, let's think about it as uh, inside a Coke can, can of Coke, and you take it out of the machine, the machine is broken, and it's hot, and you drop it on the floor, and you open it up. What happens? It explodes out of the can, <laughs> okay, because it's warm. Uh, if it were cold, you'd probably still get some explosion, but not nearly as much. Carbon dioxide dissolves in water fairly readily, and that's what happens in the oceans. And when they heat up, you get more carbon dioxide coming out of them. And when they cool down, you get less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere coming out of them. Then there's an equilibrium between those two uh, concentrations. So the correlation between carbon dioxide and temperature is a happenstance of the chemistry of the system rather than anything that has to do with driving temperature. Carbon dioxide release into the atmosphere is driven by temperature. It doesn't drive temperature. Now, if you look back at this graph for a minute, you'll see a lot of ups and downs like the one we're in now, not only here at the top of the heat cycle uh, in this warming period, as well as here down at the bottom of the cycle. You don't see as many back here because the temperature da data has a lot fewer points because it's older stuff and it's tough to evaluate uh, older geologic information. But uh, sea level, if I have my sea level graphs here, sea level has been rising for a couple of hundred years at a very steady rate. And despite the fact that we started putting in carbon dioxide, lickety split about here, 1950, and we've gone essentially parabolic in our releases of carbon dioxide, nowhere on earth is sea level reflecting any change whatsoever as a result of additional carbon dioxide. Okay, in point of, that's, that's yep. it. Okay. Okay, now it's... um. Kevin? Uh, Frank, can you stop sharing, please? Yes. Uh, Elliot, how much time do I have? Uh, I gave Frank four minutes, so I'm going to give you four minutes. Okay. We're going to get shut off shortly by uh, Zoom. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Make sure I'm on the right one. Okay. So, um, so again, if we look at 
uh, the IPCC, this is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we see that they are estimating that if we keep it to uh, just cut emissions, it'll be one to two feet. If we don't, it'll be two to three feet. And you can see it here on the graph. Uh, it'd be one to two feet if we get the, don't put so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and two to three feet if we don't. Frank's graph really intrigued me. Of all the graphs he had, this one uh, I had to do the most digging for. Uh, this is uh, the battery in New York. So it's a, a local flood tide. And the, I've looked, I, I don't know if you got this off a website, Frank. Uh, but it's from the NOAA website. Okay. So the and if NOAA you go website, and Google, also, also, if you Google battery. Yeah, okay, New sorry, York, thanks. Uh, it, yeah, if you, you also look on readily. the website, uh, it's on the left hand side there, you can see that the NOAA website says that the rate is increased and it's accelerating. So oh, that really intrigues me. Say that. Where does it say oh that? Oh gosh, Frank. Where does it say that. Come on. <laughs> this is a straight line graph. Are we looking at I, this do, graph? Can you let me finish, please? I'll try. But, okay. The uh, straight line graph, and yet the NOAA website says that it's increased more. If you look on that, that's a quote from the website. 2014 sea level is 2.6 inches above the 19, the highest annual average in the satellite record. And then it says it's accelerating. So that intrigued me, like what the heck happened? So uh, this is again from the um, one of the people at NOAA. And you can see the line up to 1970 goes this way and the line goes this way. So now it's like, well, wait a minute, how come one says it's accelerating and Frank has been uh, using this other one from New York that isn't. Uh, so I emailed them. And this is the email on the left-hand side, the stated intent of those graphs is to show linear trends that is, they fit a straight line to the data. And you can see that it says linear trends. Because the data oh, is oh, a straight God. line trend. Okay. So <laughs> the NOAA website specifically says down at the bottom here, I don't know if this is, uh, is sea level trends measured by tide gauges that are presented here are local relative to sea level trends as opposed to global sea level trends. You're not, th what they're saying is, it's a misuse of their graphs. You actually could have picked one from Stockholm that shows the sea level uh, falling. Yes, I could have, but that's because the land is rising. Okay, so these other factors are local. And so this graph has totally been misused. It doesn't no. represent the no. sea level rise. Absolutely Otherwise, not. Noah wouldn't say what they said. But I showed you three graphs, one from New York City. Yes, I know. From, one from Hawaii. And yep. one from Australia. They all show the exact same straight and line. And they stuff. all are misused. And in a minute, I'm going to show you how better. data is manipulated uh, for these purposes. Well, okay, guys, so unfortunately, we have to pause it here because we're about to get shut off. Okay. On Zoom. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned because we'll be right back with the next version, round two.